I think we're about to start our, our session this afternoon. Uh, to those of you who are still out there, please do make your way in before we start. Normally our guest used to, usually comes later, but it seems to me he's the first one to enter this room. Uh, we are so glad indeed that he still had a passion of coming back to university as you know, he's also a, a former lecturer in this great university of the South Pacific. Uh, this morning, I was uh, trying to figure out about this, uh, marking this uh, auspicious occasion about this great man of the Pacific, great man of vision. Uh, I was looking at the Bible, we can then talk in the world in Dobiloi, about this man, Samson, okay? Samson used a jawbone, a fresh jawbone. On that same jawbone, this is what he does, Samson. He killed thousands of people with one jawbone. Okay? Karma 
ngal ngal ini asa gay bok ada terbiak kini nak kelu noai. That is one of the uh, most uh, uh, wonderful uh, miracles God can do within a fresh jawbone. Remember that fresh jawbone act like a spear, sword, whatever you can name it, to kill his enemy. And not only one enemy, it's a thousand of enemies. So that story from the Bible I'd like to uh, base our, 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 our session this morning, starting off with uh, that miracle working God, the same thing that he has done to that great man, thinking of this great man, Pratu Vanai Leali Sukuna, I was thinking, wow, maybe this man is so visionary, so passionate, maybe because of the gifting and the talents which God has given him, or maybe because he came from a hierarchy family in the Fijian custom. I was thinking, what are you doing? I'm not going to be able to get out of here. I'm not going to be able to get out of here. I'm not going to be able to get out of here. O sangka may turing muri ni sing ni kuo ni wa wili kitiko na kai na kabo na kuo na balat na na nambulo sa misoni within one fresh job bone. Remember this: God can do miracles. He was so visionary, this great man. Balat ngo ni tiko nga na halo tambo ni kuo ni tiko nga na kuo. I as a chaplain of this great university, I am so privileged and. So happy to know that now the now university, which is trying to shape the Pacific future, is now recognizing God. So to those of you who are making their way in, the young of the kingdom and the bagan di tara tibo na londa, ningol marubi mo sa gikina o somewhere la bata ti sola dona kang gay tibo no somewhere la bisola sola ni durumi ko na yalo ni kalo o na yalo ng amon at matindot ay. No wonder this great man, Rato Skuna, and my Tamatan Dotani Tambani, and a Londa Runua, and a Buku, Kilaka, Yalamatuak in a Raya on the Wingerami, but let him back now, Nitikuna Klo, Nitikuna Yalo Niklo. A bombo can a cavity singer than die, and then a Tamatan Dotani, Nitikuba Kikana, Nel Niklo. Santa Mala on a Klo in the Mass, the Mass Matter. To run. I thank you, God, for this wonderful occasion. I thank you, God, for the visionary of the senior management team of God to now acknowledge you, God, as the Lord of this university. Father, indeed, it is always of great joy when we come into the presence of our Father, our Lord, and our Savior. To Ni boga yu tu ne lo iki mami miki mami ngara miki mi sena me mbeleta na buli mbeleta na ni mami kalo mata ni mtak. We are so privileged, of God, to come into your presence and acknowledge you, Father. We want to thank you for everything that you have done to this university in the last fifty-five years up until this very spot. Second of God, as I speak, I thank you, God, for guidance. I thank you, God, for wisdom. That is building our life for God and shaping this university of God to rise into the standard of God and match up with the university standard of the world of God. For this university to be recognized, I believe in God. It is through passion and resilience of God in our hearts that you have enabled us, of God, to survive the journey and enjoy our living. Today marks a wonderful day of God as we remember or commemorate of God, the goodness of real gift into our life, the goodness of God, of a great man of the Pacific, the great man of this nation of God, a man who has that vision of God, a man who has that talents and gift, the man who has dream of God, big dreams for our nation. Today, of God, we are so passionate about the greatness of your crafting, your shaping, your molding and directing of God. His life to become a pillar of strength, to come to become a Bible of our now understanding of the status of God of Fiji and its people. Father, we are blessed. Kimo mi boga bili bina na klo. Sa takan dini tigo mai bili kimo ni ne sol soli kela ngai yana. 
Every Naka came and made Bogan and Mumutik with a singer day night. He may be a car to run and he may be Bogan and Binaka and Luki Mam. He said Bogan to Tiku be Kimuni in the Kenlewa. Go on a singer to run, he may be Rokobi Kimuni. He won't be Bogan and Binaka with Kimuni. Balaka to run and the big Kambuli Bulebala. The big Kaki to run and the Zangi, the Wai, the Wok in the Kain, but let them put a woman go to run. And the Pagar Rolong of Kimu and two and the Dominoa. Ka Kabala to Kimu be Kanelawa, say Kimuni, Tamaki Mami, Polomala. Kimami be a Kai to run and the Mami Boga Binibinak. Nivoga you two in the clone, the Wuglish Tamata, the Bon Booty Kimuni, and the Gaelic and the Bunu of Nibor of Tabigi Mami. Imami Sam Masu, we came in the clone. Ninguém vou levar o tanto rang na rebote de tudo que aqui nela matua na boca do bagaio ela na boca do lomba lá na remitindo na lomba de bumbu o turanga na bumbu o bumbu o turanga me tudo então ele ela não embula a ser barba quando ele está no rau ele não anima ninguém assim ele é zobo não anima me clou ele não anima ninguém na rebote do tanque na cor de bumbu lá lá em fevereiro de boca que mal me na clou ele quer nela o sul é bem que mal me na quer embula o bagaio matou o tanque não anima me vaga sama Bless this nation of God. Bless the leadership of God of this great university. And I pray, Father God, that there will be a greater deposit of wisdom in each individual of God that enters this gate of God, so that their eyes may see, the eyes of their heart of God may acknowledge that there is a God who is more than enough. And we see again like a Sambulukina. In Jesus' wonderful name, we pray and say, Our Father who art in heaven, our Lord be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Give us from evil. Lion is the kingdom. The power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Sakando kaindina, and on the sotan of liberty clue. It is indeed of great joy in the hearts of men are knitted together, not because of this auspicious occasion. I believe it is because of God's wonderful crafting, shaping and molding us to understand that He, the Lord we serve, is more than enough. Não vou embora até na clo, vou então na ngão no binaca vi cana. Na lube viti, da me borrou taque na corne buli de de rumbo. Na rende sram, e lá sou na temata em dia do ano na clo. I'm thankful indeed for the wonderful uh, recognition of this great man or the best, the one of the best gift of God into the Pacific. I now call the deputy vice chancellor to introduce our guest this wonderful day. Thank you very much, uh, Chaplain Penny, for the wonderful praise and those introductory remarks. Uh, before I introduce our distinguished guest today, I would like to call upon one of my colleagues uh, to please bring the salut salut and the gala and our chief guest. Thank you. Assembly Vinaka and uh, Namaste, and uh, very good, a very good uh, evening to you all. Uh, foremost, on behalf of the Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Paul Alwalia, the senior management team, and the staff and students of USP, I would like to warmly welcome you all to this event. I'm Chita Bonoli Lai, the Deputy Vice Chancellor in charge of education. It is indeed, as the Chaplain Penny mentioned, Today is an historical event, and in the sense that uh, we are remembering an historical and a great Fijian statesman, Batu Sukuna, a beloved son of Fiji, who is the forerunner 
of the post-independence leadership of Fiji. And we are doing so through another incredible son of Fiji, the distinguished professor, Stephen Ratuba. Professor Ratuba is an award-winning global interdisciplinary scholar who is pro vice chancellor, as well as the director of the Maximilian Brown Center for Pacific Studies at the University of Canterbury. He was the first Pacific person in the world to be appointed distinguished professor, the highest professional level. He's president of the International Association of Social Science and he's a chair of the International Political Science Association Research Committee on the Climate, Security and Planetary Politics. He was Fulbright Professor at the University of California, Los Angeles, the Duke University, North Carolina, and Georgetown University, Washington, DC. He has also been an academic fellow at a number of universities around the world. He was winner of the University of Canterbury Research Medal winner of the Canterbury Sustainability Research Medal winners, sorry about that, of the New Zealand Medgy Medal. And that is the highest for social science research excellence in New Zealand. And he was elected as fellow of the New Zealand Royal Society for International Research Distinction. He has published widely, including an analysis of Ratu Suolana Sukuna's legacy. He is New Zealand government appointee in a number of national boards and committees. This includes being engaged as an expert advisor for Statistics New Zealand on redefining ethnic groups for the next national census and part of the academic team of experts helping to put together the New Zealand National Security Strategy. He was recently appointed as a climate change commissioner by the Governor General of New Zealand. He has led a number of international experts on global ethnicity, development, global security, COVID-19, and social protection and climate security. He led a team of 200 international experts to put together the world's biggest and most comprehensive book on ethnicity. He has carried out advisory and consultancy roles for a number of organizations such as United Nations, UNDP, World Bank, International Labor Organization, the British Council, the International Institute for Democracy, and elect electoral assistance, the Pacific Islands Forum, the Commonwealth Secretariat, the Asian Development Bank, and several governments. His research interests and expertise span a number of disciplines and thematic areas, including international relations, political sociology, historical memory, coups, militarism, ethnicity, development studies, nationalism, conflict, and peace studies, social index ecology, artificial intelligence, digital social control, social protection, affirmative action, and the politics of climate emergency. He has written more than 200 books, book chapters, journal articles, and other scholarly works. In his non-academic life, Rotuva was president of the Fiji Bodybuilding Federation years ago. I think he still got the body there, Rotuva. <laughs> He's also a keyboard musician and singer. He formed the Spice Boys Band with Sayla Satora, who played during parties at USP. And as an artist, he drew cartoons for a number of papers and magazines. And one of his lasting legacies is the large modern, modern art mural at Lambert Hall 
Marriage Brothers High School. And uh, that's something that we have in common because I was there as well at Marriage Brothers High School, <laughs> which he painted at the age of 16 when he was a student at Marriage Brothers High School. It is a depiction of the challenging dynamics of multi multiculturalism in Fiji. He was born in Nyale on the beautiful island of Kandahar. And with an extensive biography, I welcome Patu. Professor. Thank you, Professor Patu. Well, thanks so much, Dunawalevu, uh, uh, Professor Unalela, for the very uh, kind and very uh, well, um, you know, um, interesting uh, background uh, discussion of uh, um, my short bio. Now, um, the sample we're not going to run, get a maram, but we'll then never to run a wiki. Um, Namaste, Salam, Octalium. Um, <coughs> I would like to first of all acknowledge the existence here, or the presence here, rather, of um, the Deputy Prime Minister. Um, thanks very much for coming, and uh, a former minister as well. And uh, all of you who are here, the staff and students of the university. And last but not least, the Ministry of uh, uh, Tokyo Affairs, uh, whose organization and whose invitation allowed me to be here. Thank you so much for everything. And, uh, and the Sukuna Day, or the Sukuna Week, rather, uh, has given us a lot of things to think about in terms of uh, the great man I'll be talking about in the next uh, uh, 45 minutes or so. So, uh, um, happy Ratasukuna Day to all of you. Thank you so much for being here. And we hope, so we hope that uh, after the uh, discussion, the lecture, uh, we'll have time for, for dialogue, for Talanoa. And perhaps you can share some of your questions, some of your ideas. Let's make it as participatory as possible. Now, I would like to start by asking the question, why exactly are we having Rod Skuna Day? Because people have come and gone, and why him in particular? Now, there are a number of things. One is Rod Skuna was probably the most prominent of sons of Fiji who lived around his time in terms of education, in terms of his uh, transformational thinking, some of the institutional foundation that is set up to build the, the, the modern Fiji. Although it was during the colonial days, in fact, he died about 12, 13 years before uh, independence. But the ideological, the political, the ideas that he had set uh, on the ground and also in grooming the leaders, the leaders who became uh, Sir Kamsas Mara, to George Thakumbau, to Edward Thakumbau, and Dr. Pena Nganilao. These were all groomed by him and prepared Fiji for independence in 1970. So not only was he a high chief of, of note, he was also a brilliant scholar, um, and of course, a revered statesman. Uh, people have, over the years, provided the narrative, the run out of words, how to describe um, uh, Ratsukuna, the mekes, the songs, the poems which were written about him has filled our country over the years, filled our history with words of gratitude and appreciation of what he did. Now, um, he cherished education. We are now in an in education institution. Education was one of his first and foremost focus. As growing up as a young boy uh, in Fiji, he was aiming higher and higher and higher. A lesson to all of us in terms of breaking the ceiling, the glass, the glass ceiling which was set during the colonial days, that 
no colonized person, or in those days they called them natives, who were supposed to be educated, and he was able to break through that. And he had to fight very hard to go to Oxford. Uh, in fact, first of all, to New Zealand to get his matriculation, a uh, pre-university qualification before going off to that kingdom. I'll talk about that later. And he was also a reformist, the kind of reforms I'll talk about later in terms of the modern Fiji. How would he want reforms in Fiji to take place, given uh, the way in which he saw the world? He saw Fiji moving uh, during the, uh, the early last century, the time when he was living. So he was also a man of empathy, empathy in terms of having feeling for other ethnic groups, for other people who are marginalized within the communities, particularly the Tokyo community in those days, the class divisions and the way in which society was structured, um, um, had his ideas moving uh, and the way in which he wanted to address some of the issues of in inequity. So we're trying to celebrate his life um, in a way which is fitting and that we, uh, we have the whole week to do that. And thanks very much for the new government for, for doing that. Uh, in fact, uh, Rotskona Day used to be celebrated years ago until that was terminated um, by the previous government. There were a number of, partly because of the kind of ideological and political framing of him, um, uh, he was uh, perceived particularly by critics uh, as being somebody whose symbolism, whose ideas um, uh, inspired the nationalistic ideas, ideas which, uh, which, uh, uh, which would have led to some of the issues in the past, in Fiji in 1987 and 2000. I'll uh, look at later how some of these ideas are probably misconceived. Now, so uh, today we're celebrating, uh, in fact, this month, we're celebrating uh, Ratskuna Day and also the Gilmit Day uh, two weeks ago and Ratuma Day as well. Uh, which is a great symbolic gesture of diversity and, um, and unity in our country. And it also happens to be my birthday uh, in May, um, 18th of May. Now, no, nothing to do with, uh, I'm not saying that I, um, I'm equating myself to Ritzkuna. No, no, he belongs to another level of, uh, uh, I may say, of divinity. Now, now, let's look at his background, the genesis of his of his, uh, if you like, genealogical ties and growing up. What was he like? Now, he was born in on the 22nd of April in 1888, and then he died in May, 30th of May, um, 1958. Now, 18... 88, to put things in context in Fiji, was a very significant time. That was when a lot of changes were taking place, uh, the codification of land owning system. There used to be diverse ways of land ownership and use in Fiji. Uh, so they brought them all together under the, if you like, the Matangali system that we have now. And land was codified and every uh, Matangali had uh, associated with their group. Uh, was land and paddles as well. So that was the time when things were happening um, uh, around the moment he was born. So he was born in a, into a Chigli family on Bau. Uh, his father, uh, Choni Manrariwi, was the son of the Bau noble uh, and rebel leader, Ratumara Kapewai. He was a, Ratumara Kapewai was a very colorful, when you read about his history, very colorful person. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the political dynamics in Fiji in those days, particularly those associated with Bau, uh, they refer to the term Verevakam Bau nowadays, um, was quite interesting in terms of the power struggle between the different chiefs and so forth. Now, uh, now Ratuman the, the uh, himself, the father, uh, he was part of the civil service, the colonial civil service, and he rose through the ranks pretty fast. And that helped a lot uh, in terms of making connections within the civil service and with the colonial government to allow for Rajkuna uh, to move ahead with his education. 
Now, his mother, Andre Litiana Maopa, was the sister of the Tunayau, Ratu Alfredi Finau, Ulkalala, who was the high chief of, of Lao uh, in those days. And uh, um, uh, Ratu Alfredi, uh, whose father brought to David the uh, Kemba, uh, who was the father of Ratu Sekamsa Mara. So we have the lineage of chiefs uh, within the Kemba and connected to the Mao lineage. So that gave Ratu Kuna a lot in terms of his chiefly status uh, between the two chiefly households. Now, although he was not, again, this is a long story. I don't want to dwell on that too much. Not actually given a title in Bao itself, but uh, he was eventually made the Tui Lao in 1938, Tui Lao, which is a title was originally uh, made for Maafu, who was the uh, Tongan royalty in Fiji, who was supposed to be the Tongan Tong protector uh, in Fiji. This official title they gave him, and the Tuinaya was sort of the Tuilau uh, was supposed to be associated with it. Now, now let's look at the constellation of the young Mai. Now, I use the word constellation deliberately. Now, when our ancestors were sailing across the Pacific uh, years and years ago in search of islands, the constellation of stars was with the main ways in which they could navigate. So not only in terms of the connection between stars, but also the connection between stars and people and the land uh, and the fish and the trees. So uh, uh, within the thinking, the, the indigenous Fijian thinking of constellation, the connections in between uh, uh, all these things was very much the way Ratsukuna himself uh, saw the world and how he was able to make connections between the different, not so much stars, but people, and the people, the land, the people, and the, uh, uh, the different groups within, within Fiji. And I'll talk about that later in relation to the way in which he uh, worked very hard to put together institutions uh, in relation to that, if you like, constellation. Now, uh, so growing up, Ratsukuna was introduced despite perceptions, particularly um, one of the reasons why, as I mentioned earlier, why the Ratsukuna day was, was canceled was because of what was perceived to be his association with Fijian, with Toke, ethno nationalism. Um, now that was not really uh, true in a look at the historical uh, context within in which he grew. He was exposed to diverse cultures at a very early age. Uh, he started his formal education at the Weruku Indian School in, in Ra, which was founded in 1898. 1898 is quite uh, a distance away historically by Pandit Badri Maharaj. Uh, he later served uh, um, from 1917 to 1929 as the first Indo-Fijian member of uh, Fiji's Legislative Council, which is now the parliament. So uh, uh, that early connection with an Indian school uh, context and the way that he was able to get himself assimilated into um, uh, a multicultural context was something which also reshaped his life in later years. Now, one of the teachers, one of his teachers at the school was Reverend Charles Andrew. Um, he was Oxford educated, an Anglican clergyman, um, and Oxford and the Anglican Church, these were two pillars of the colonial empire in those days. And the idea of education, the idea of progress was associated with the link between these two. And the Anglican Church, of course, is the official church of England. Head of the Anglican Church is the queen of, well, no longer the queen, is the king of England. So, uh, so Charles get provided private tuition. And that's very important in those days. Private tuition uh, uh, was seen as not only for sons of elites, was also one of the best ways of education because you have a one-to-one -one, uh, process of education between the teacher and the student, rather than you have a mess of say 10, 15, nowadays 50 students, and then only one teacher. Now, so, and then, uh, one of the things that he developed pretty early and pretty fast was, the, was his command of the English language. Uh, I've been coming to Fiji over the years, uh, you know, 
uh, since my days, the kind of English spoken on the radio waves uh, by university students has changed significantly since our days. But that's, uh, that's quite common everywhere in the world. So Rotsukuna was able to speak, and one of the uh, uh, Darius Carr wrote that when Rotsukuna spoke, uh, it was no different from the royalties, um, the House of Lords. Uh, I don't want to imitate it here. I'll get it wrong. Uh, I used to when I used to be drunk in Britain uh, as a student. And, and that, in many ways, not only shaped uh, his thinking, the way he was able to articulate himself so well that he earned the respect of the Europeans, well, of the British, particularly the colonial officials. Uh, and then, of course, later when he went to Britain to study. Now, um, and then um, he went over to uh, uh, Tuangani College, College uh, in New Zealand. Uh, some of you who are familiar with New Zealand, uh, Wanganui College yet, it's, it's not as popular as before. In those days, it was probably one of the top three, four uh, schools in New Zealand. They were owned by the Anglican Church, and they were supposed to be uh, for the, the children of, of the elites uh, in those days. So uh, it was a boarding school as well as a boys' school. Uh, it was only in the 1990s became co-educational, and a number of our Fijian uh, chiefs also went there as well. Now, that's when he began to discover and articulate his brilliance in different things, not only in relation to being a very bright student. In fact, he passed his matriculation, which is the uh, matriculation is, is the exam that you sit before you go to university. Uh, and he was also a strong debater. He remained a great debater in the legislation, in legislative council all the years. Uh, and played rugby and cricket and became the Wanganui College uh, boxing champion. There was a boxer as well. Uh, he was a rugby player. He was virtually everything. Uh, and then I'll talk to you later about some of the, uh, uh, some of the lessons we can learn from those multi multiple skills that he was able to exhibit uh, in his student days. Now, very similar to some of the students I know in New Zealand, he ran out of money. And nowadays, you can actually work if you're a student. You do a PhD. Uh, I have about 20 PhDs in my institute. And uh, they all work. I give them work as well. They also have work, um, you know, outside the university. Uh, the, you know, the, the visa or the permit, student permit allows them to do that. So, uh, um, so because of the financial problem, so he decided to come back to Fiji. Um, um, and then he went through the civil service pretty fast, pretty quickly because of his, uh, uh, he has matriculated. And also of his command of the language. And the language goes not only, language is not something that you speak. Language is connected with culture, it's connected with knowledge systems, connected with your relationship with, with, with structures uh, and people as well. So, uh, uh, so he was able to go through the civil service pretty fast and became a chief translator for the government. He became a chief translator for the government in those days it was quite a significant thing. Um, no, so he became, and then he went to he went to a bit of academia, a little bit like some of us. Um, uh, in 1909, he became the assistant master of the Lao Provincial Council. Uh, the uh, 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 general was the beginning of his, of his educational career, I suppose. And then at the age of 21, he was, he was a, uh, the visiting examiner at the Queen Victoria School. Um, that was, he was the, the very first local uh, for that position, and also at the Levuka Public School. Now, so this switch from being a student to being, if you like, being uh, an educational um, administrator, educationist, was a turning point in his life in a number of ways. Uh, he began to look outwards. He began to look at the future in terms of further, degree, further studies uh, to do a degree at some point. No toke in those days, 
uh, had a university degree. Uh, he was uh, so uh, so he would have seen that and saw that at some point we will have to move out of where we are uh, and then move forward with our education. Now I'm using the word toke here uh, not because it's officially uh, you know decreed uh, uh, constitutionally. Uh, it's to do with the self-definition of the indigenous Fijian. Sociologists talk about two kinds of ethnic definitions. One is um, is outgroup definition, how somebody frames you and gives you a label and then becomes what you are. And secondly is in-group definition, how the group itself defines itself. So for years, the uh, indigenous Fijians have seen themselves as the toke, or can the tone toke, and so forth. Although it became very contentious over the years uh, as a result of the way in which some of those labels have been politicized and we lose sight of the in-group definition uh, and then we move towards the, politi the political meanings of these words. Now, um, so it was at that point that he started looking for a way out in terms of not way out of Fiji, but the way out of the small space, the small circle that he found himself in, in the civil service. He wanted further study. And of course, his father wrote to uh, uh, Manrami, we had connections uh, with, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, also with the governor, Sir Francis Henry May in those days. Uh, and then uh, 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 asked him uh, about the possibility of having Raj Kuna to study at Oxford. Uh, or any university in Britain in those days. Oxford and Cambridge were probably the only universities which had some significant uh, presence. Uh, in fact, uh, by the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, a lot more universities were set up in Britain, but the original ones were those two. Now, so, so eventually he entered Wetham College in Oxford in 1913. Uh, but but he was not necessarily the very first toke to go to university. That may sound strange. While he was the first one to graduate from the university, he was not necessarily the first one. Dr. Thel Lua, in, uh, who was the eldest son of Dr. Sir Vakumau, had gone to Sydney to study at the uh, Newton, um, uh, Newington College. And then, uh, uh, according to some stories, he actually ended up studying at university, but he, uh, he didn't finish for three years uh, before he came back to Fiji. That was well before independence, sorry, well before session. The session was in 1874. Uh, Lua was studying in Sydney around eight, in the 1860s. Now, but in fact, he wanted to go to Cambridge to do law, for uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, the usual constraints of money uh, held him back. Now, very little is written about Ratsakuna's uh, university days. A lot of the work that is written about him have to do with his work in government, uh, his uh, work in institutional reform, but not so much uh, what he was doing and how he felt about university life. Now, let me put, this in, put things in context around the period Around the 18, around the 19, um, early 19th century in Britain, university education was very restricted. Uh, only children um, of the, uh, if you like, the high class had access to Oxford and Cambridge. If you had the title, for instance, or if you are extremely smart, then allow you to come in. Uh, they were not even co educational. Uh, if you're a woman, then your place within the higher education system was not something which was appreciated in those days. Now, in Oxford itself, the, uh, the, the uh, if you like, the non-white students from Africa in particular, um, from the colonies, had started early in the 1800s. In fact, the very first black student in Oxford in those days was Cole. Uh, he graduated with the Bachelor of Arts. Arts. Um, and uh, 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 he was taken in there by, uh, by the Church of England uh, priests. 
So within the period, the thinking in Europe, which has to do with race, was very much based on what some of you social scientists would have learned uh, to do with social Darwinism. Uh, Charles Darwin was a biologist who talked about evolution, biological evolution of species from a very simple species to complex species like us. So we were supposed to have started evolving from Namibia in the water and so forth. And then we jumped ashore. Well, we became fish for some number of million years. And then uh, we jumped ashore, became frogs, and then ran around as uh, dogs for some time, and then horses. And then uh, we climbed trees, became monkeys. And then the tree broke, branch broke, and then we fell down, became gorillas. And then now you're here. So the social scientists took that literally and argue that all societies in the world are supposed to have evolved from simple societies into complex societies. Around the time, around the 1700s in Europe, the period of what is known as the period of enlightenment, that's when scholars began to see the world in so-called scientific terms. So they tried, they tried to create what came to be known as um, scientific racism, where different racial groups, depending very much on your genetic makeup, uh, will fit into the structure depending very much on the level of intelligence. So if you are a white, of course, you're up there. And if you're a Fijian, uh, you're down there somewhere, uh, and, and, so, and so forth. So that became very much part of the Western narrative for a long time. Uh, in fact, embedded uh, deeply into the social sciences uh, over the years, whether well, it's to do with the political science, um, in economics and sociology and anthropology, but in subtle ways to do with evil, to do with progression, to do with mod modernization. Now, Rajapuna would have gone through studying this, but then um, he would have been hurt by the fact that, oh, I'm supposed to be at the lowest level of intellectual advancement, while uh, those who have water skins are supposed to have, um, you know, um, much higher levels of, of, uh, of enhancement. So, uh, uh, so in some ways that also shaped, as I will look at later, uh, that kind of thinking also shaped some of the reforms that he was to uh, embark on in Fiji, the setting up the Native Land Trust Board being one of them, and his relationship with the Great Council of Chiefs. I'll talk about that later in the reform, which is happening. Now, he was a heroic warrior as well. Uh, you can see his medals over there. Uh, now, just when he started his education at Oxford, this First World War broke out. And so everybody, the universities, the, uh, the corporations, the civil service, uh, the able-bodied men will join the army. Now, there was a colonial policy of the British, and that is not to allow those in the the colonized people to take up arms uh, to fight in the war. And there was a reason for that. And that is, they didn't want the guns to be turned against them because there'd been anti-colonial resistance in Africa and Asia, in various parts of the world. Uh, even in Fiji, in fact, in the 1800s, um, there was a resistance against British rule as well in Fiji. And there were a lot of those, uh, particularly up in the uh, uh, interior of Viti level. And a lot of this, uh, resistance movements were suppressed. So Ratsukuna was not allowed to handle a gun for that purpose. So the option for him was to join the French Legion. The French were a bit more enlightened. In the, I'm not saying that they were better colonialists. Uh, they were probably worse than the British uh, in different ways. They didn't want to allow their colonies to become independent. You have to fight your way out of the colonial mode to become independent in the French colony. So, uh, uh, and then uh, as, a, as a French as a soldier, uh, he was able to, uh, uh, to excel. And um, he was, uh, uh, in fact, given a medal uh, by the French. Now, for him in his mind, like in other colonies in those days, fighting the war was significant in terms of making a statement. And the statement, was to do with, yes, I can fight, and therefore I need respect from you. In New Zealand, uh, the Maori battalions, which went for the war, First World War and the Second World War, 
one of the reasons why they joined up was not so much to support the British, because they hated the British anyway, because they took all their land, uh, but simply to, to make a statement. And the statement was that he, uh, you know, the statement was, we have to fight this war and show our colonialists that we are tough. And we also have the capacity to be able to change things politically, given the circumstances. So, uh, um, uh, but then he returned to France later and the following year. Um, uh, and a lot of the so-called native uh, um, battalions, uh, they were called in those days, were involved mostly in transportation work by carrying uh, you know, uh, guns and, uh, and, and, uh, and provision for the soldiers. So for his reason, he was awarded the uh, Croix de Guerre Medal by the French. And uh, um, uh, that also had a lot of impact uh, on him in terms of, uh, first he was a scholar uh, and how it impact, impacted on his future work and also um, as, a, as a war hero. Uh, and you put them together, then you had the making of a statesman beginning to take shape. Now let's look at uh, what I call, uh, yeah, uh, in fact, the Fijian, the other version which I have over here uh, in my paper is the Vunilangi in the horizon. Now the Vunilangi is the, the Fijian word for horizon. He was somebody who defined the horizon uh, looking beyond. As our ancestors were sailing across the Pacific, they realized that horizon was probably, apart from the constellation of stars, which I mentioned earlier, it was also the horizon. The horizon was supposed to be endless. Beyond the horizon, which you can see, um, more and more horizons, and it keeps going and keeps going. So, uh, and the way that he thought and the way that he saw things was endless in terms of his visionary. Um, unfortunately, uh, his life uh, was not at all as he would have wanted. Now, towards the end of 1918, he graduated from um, the history course he was doing, uh, and also. Uh, he proceeded to the Middle Temple in London. Uh, he graduated actually with two degrees, the LLB, um, the uh, Bachelor of Law, and also Bachelor of Arts uh, in History. Uh, but then unfortunately, uh, Ratuman Ravi, uh, uh, his father had died in 1920. Uh, so he had to uh, return home uh, to take his place within the Mapangali. Now, interestingly, when he came back home, uh, something changed. He brought with him the Sulu that you're wearing now. He transformed the fashion for males. He transformed diplomacy and politics because Sulu was associated with diplomatic dress, with, uh, with, with, with political dress as well. And now it's become Pacific wine. As someone's, they say that it's this. I said, hang on, not really. Uh, the Tongans say, it says, no, hang on, not really. It belongs to Rochakuna, the way he dressed up in the early days was the formal wear was very, and without people realizing he had single-handedly transformed fashion in Fiji in a significant way. Uh, when I came in yesterday, I tried to run around looking for Sulu to wear, then I realized that none matched my, my coat and then I, uh, when I came in, when my mother passed away, I went to buy Sulu, and then I quickly got it. And then when I wore it, and I realized that it was, uh, uh, it had this uh, these designs on it, like you see nowadays. My parents, my uh, relatives, were saying, "Oh my gosh, what are you wearing?" Went, really? Um, and then I, I looked down and I saw the uh, massive designs. But then, but that's one of the. Uh, uh, the version, the artistic version of Rachakura's solo design. Now, so in 1922, he became a chief assistant to the Native Lands Commission. Um, uh, and uh, he was appointed to the Legislative Council as well uh, to represent the Tokyo community. Uh, in those days, membership of the uh, Legislative Council was largely through, um, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, was largely through uh, um, appointments. Nowadays we have elections, uh, as we, we found out. Now, uh, and he also attended the coronation of King George uh, the, the sixth, 
and Queen Elizabeth in London, not Queen Elizabeth II, but the wife of King George VI in 1937. Now, um, one of the things which made Ratsakuna very, very significant was the fact that he was able to travel from village to village while he was uh, a civil servant, talking to villages. Now, this was symbolic and very significant in a number of ways, as I will talk about a little bit later. I was just thinking about it, because if you're an academic, one of the ways in which uh, Pacific scholarship, and Pacific research methodology is being now being redefined is the way in which you engage with communities face-to-face uh, -face, and you reframe your methodology to suit the cultural circumstances and the context within which you do your research. Now, he was actually the very first to do it. He was actually the very first one to go to the village, sit around, sit with them over cover. Oh, sorry. That's in New Zealand, uh, over Yangona, uh, and, uh, uh, and engage with them uh, in heart to heart discussions about the future of Fiji and their problems, something which not many politicians now do. Now, and all the reforms that he was able to bring about was through the collection of knowledge, the collection of information through of that grassroots engagement. Uh, at the village level. He was able, I mean, he traveled across the rivers in, in horseback uh, around Vitilebu. He traveled to the islands, Kandabu, Lao, Vitilebu, everywhere at a time when no one was doing those things. Now, and of course, the Second World War uh, started in, in 1940, 1939. And then by 1942, he had started recruitment uh, of Fijian soldiers to join the army. No, but the Second World War, the British had seen the light, and they trusted that if you give these guns to these colonized uh, people, then um, perhaps they won't pull the trigger. Uh, they will shoot the, either the Japanese or the Nazis in Germany. So uh, they allowed the, the Fijian battalion to go and fight in the Somme Islands. And Ratsukuna was very much instrumental in putting those battalions together, was very much instrumental uh, in ensuring that uh, uh, that they actually went out to fight. And behind, in the subconscious uh, mind of Ratsukuna, like I mentioned earlier, uh, getting them to go and fight uh, is not just to win the war, but also to win their claim to legitimacy as a group of people, uh, to win their claim in the modern state system, uh, which was very, very significant. And a lot of the uh, colonized people in the world, they use participation in the war as a means of doing that. Like I said earlier, the Maoris have been, uh, were trying to do that as well, as the Fijians uh, too. Now, one of Ratsukura's uh, uh, greatest achievement was his role in the establishment of the Nat Native Land Trust Board, now the Toki Trust Board, um, way back in 1940. Now, that became a bit contentious up until now for a number of reasons. Uh, one was that uh, it meant that you have to set up an institution which will then look after and minister the Tokyo land. Uh, there was a resistance from a lot of people in the community, a lot of the uh, landowners. Uh, and the perception was that we're losing our land to this foreign institution called the Native Land Trust Board. But then in his mind, he was thinking, if we don't do anything to protect the way a land is being used and utilized, then we're going to all suffer from what has happened elsewhere, such as in New Zealand. Um, and also, it was around that time uh, that he would see agriculture, he would see development uh, in Fiji expanding, uh, especially the role of the Indo-Fijians. Uh, in the sugar plantation. And then he uh, made a very interesting statement in the legislative council. Uh, he said, um, uh, he referred to the Indian desire for more permanent tenancy <clears throat> as a natural and legitimate consequence of an agricultural community setting in any country. And the need, so on one hand, he saw the need for leasing of land 
for the uh, agricultural purposes for Indo-Fijians. And then on the other hand, he said the need to protect the interests of present and future Fijian landowners. So how can you protect the land on one hand? And on the other hand, how can you uh, lease and then allow for land to be used for commercial purposes, but it's still maintaining a sense of coherence? So that was a very central, uh, if you like, thinking around the setting up of the Native Land Trust Board when it was first set up in 1940. Now, because of the initial resistance from the landowners, again, he traveled village after village, listen to them, what is your problem? And then he will come back and listen to them again, over and over again. So he was into uh, what researchers refer to as the uh, repeat epistemology, which is to do with you engage with listeners, and then you capture what they have in mind, and then you go back, uh, and then you listen to them again, and then you share ideas. Now, so, uh, so there was, there was, in fact, what I, the, the quotation which I gave you was, in fact, uh, the speech that he gave to the Greek Council of Chiefs, 1933. There was also some resistance of the Greek Council of Chiefs, so Chiefs, Chiefs, sorry, uh, uh, in 1933. Um, and uh, eventually there was consensus because of the way in which he himself, his mana, and his command of the English language, his command of the traditional diplomacy, and his command of politics in Fiji in those days, and his well-versed thinking about land itself and the problems of land in other countries in the world, where the British were, where colonialism had taken place, and he was able to put all these things together. He was able to convince the chiefs this is the way to do it. Now, so in some ways, he was a believer in consensus building, consensus building uh, in relation to uh, the issue of land in particular, which is still very contentious over the years, still was very contentious over the years up until now. Now, um, after the Great Council of Chiefs had endorsed the, uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, the Native Land Trust Board. Um, the, uh, the governor in those days, Sir Philip Mitchell, he made a very interesting statement. Um, it was probably one of the, uh, the greatest acts of faith and trust in colonial history. Uh, the, the kind of trust that people had in Ratskuna to be able to do what they did, which never happened in many other countries, in, in the, a lot of other colonies in the world, where there was a lot of tension, especially after independence. This came to the fore. Now, so Ratsukuna himself has set out to determine what portion of land should be reserved and which portion of the land uh, should be used for future, uh, for the future of the Matangali. So he had these multiple layers of vision. On one hand, uh, let's maintain the land. At the same time, let's use some land for commercial purposes. Now, he became Secretary of the Fijian Affairs. Uh, in 1944, and uh, uh, and then around the same period, um, his role in global politics became recognized. The British, often the British, they don't trust their their if you like colonial subjects to represent them in international affairs. But Sukuna was one of the very few who was trusted. Uh, he became part of the British. Uh, he, in fact, he was advisor to the uh, uh, to the British uh, um, team um, in the negotiation um, in the United Nations negotiation in 1950 um, in the United Nations Fourth Committee. Now, the Fourth Committee of the United Nations, those of you familiar with the uh, in the UN, uh, they deal with issues of decolonization. They deal with issues of Palestine. They deal with issues of peace uh, uh, and, uh, um, and stability and all those. So it was one of the most significant, probably the most significant uh, committee of the United Nations. And uh, uh, so the Ratchikuna being advisor to the British in that committee was quite groundbreaking in those days. And very much, certainly in, in, the, in, the, in the Pacific, 
uh, no one in the Pacific had been in the room, and certainly no one um, uh, in, the, in the colonies. Now, he was made commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire in 1939, and was awarded knighthood in 1946. Uh, and then he received the second knighthood, uh, the KCMG, the knight commander of the order of St. Charles and St. George, 1953. Some of uh, us have been struggling to get just one knighthood. Uh, we couldn't get it. Um, in fact, in OBE, uh, but he had two, which is quite significant and very, very unique in those days. Now, and then he became the Speaker of the Legislative Council in 1954, uh, which was significant, extremely significant in a number of ways. There you had all the colonial, if you like, political leaders, and he was sitting there ordering, ordering them around, and no one uh, has ever done that to them. And his command of the English language, his ability to read the politics, his ability to be able to bring consensus were his weapons of controlling the legislative council. Some of you may have not much of his, uh, we don't see a lot of videos around this period. Uh, I saw one online when the queen visited and he, when he was, uh, I think he, uh, uh, yeah, he had to uh, 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 make, generate make a statement uh, in the uh, legislative council and uh, the english was was, was superb and then uh, uh, and, and he was uh, you know just just out of his world in terms of how he was able to control the proceedings now now he also was involved a little bit in politics now the fijian association one of the very first parties which was formed in 1956 um, uh, under the leadership of Ratu Sir edward Takubau, uh, he provided support. Or oh, you want to form a political party, that's fine. And there was probably at the time when, but a bit less than 20 years before independence, the, the things were beginning to unfold uh, in relation to the move towards independence. Now, um, so by the time of independence, like I mentioned earlier, some of those he had personally mentored, some of those he had faith in, became leaders like Rutzer Kamsas Mara, whom he sent to Oxford. Rutzer Kamsas Mara uh, was, a, was a medical student in Otago. And then uh, uh, Rutzer Kuna was looking for somebody uh, for continuity uh, purposes uh, to take over. And uh, Rutzer Mara was his choice. So he got him to go to Oxford. He didn't like it, but uh, that was what his uncle uh, had him. Had, had installed for him. So he had no choice but to do that. Now, when he died in May 1958, because he had committed much of his life, he had committed his resources, he had committed his ideas, his knowledge, his wisdom to the country, to the people, uh, he died, uh, you know, According to some stories, he only had 50 cents left in his pocket, uh, uh, which is very different from other parts of the world where in Africa, for instance, uh, when, when leaders became leaders, they became millionaires as well. Uh, part of the reason why this political conflict. I'm not saying that the leaders nowadays, they do that. I, I, I see Professor Biman Prasad uh, smiling at me and saying, Steve, I hope you're not talking about me. No, no. Uh, so that was the extent to which he had committed himself in principle, his totality of his life to the service of the country. Let me quickly check my time because I'm, I'm moving now to the last part. Of, sorry. Let me quickly jump to the uh, last part of the presentation. Now, there were some criticisms as well. Uh, no one is perfect. Uh, he caught some criticisms from scholars, uh, from politicians. Um, and uh, one of the criticisms was that he was, uh, he also had an ethnic view of, of, of politics. But then when you think about it, politics in Fiji in those days uh, was very ethnically divided anyway. Uh, if you say something, you're bound to be framed to have an ethnic point of view because of the way in which the colonial, the British were very quite strategic in the way they play one ethnic, ethnic group against the other. Uh, in India, Muslim versus uh, uh, 
um, Hindus in Africa tribe of uh, tribe versus another tribe in Fiji, Indo Fijians and in Tokay. Uh, so, uh, so the kind of political dynamics happening in Fiji was ethnic anyway. Uh, so, uh, uh, inevitably, one will you try your best not to be ethnic, but inevitably somebody is going to put you in a box, uh, and then say that you are such and such. Secondly, uh, one of the criticisms was that he was uh, too close to the British, that he was a defender of the British policy of uh, um, of indirect rule. Those of you who are not familiar with the indirect rule uh, policy of the British was that instead of directly manipulating, operating things on the ground, you use others to do things for you. Uh, either in the case of Fiji, the Great Council of Chiefs, or or you use particular individuals. Uh, but I suppose that criticism as well, um, when you read deeper into Ratsukuna, is probably not well founded. Uh, fundamentally, because he was trying his best when you read uh, what he has been doing uh, to you work within the system, not so much to revolve against the system, in which case things might just collapse but to work slowly within the system, make sure that the reforms, that you uh, don't make the British too angry, otherwise they'll just cut off the, uh, uh, the, uh, the facilitation of the reform that you're doing. So he was quite smart in making changes here at the same time, uh, making sure that uh, it's on the right side of politics. Now, the third criticism that he's really caught particularly by some uh, scholars, uh, was that he was the defender of the protectionist policies. The protectionist policy, which started off with first Governor Gordon, actually locked the Tokays into villages. And by the time the, uh, the liberal reform had taken place to allow the Tokays to become much more educated, going to commerce, uh, it was, they found themselves behind in everything, education, in uh, uh, commerce in uh, other things. And that led to a lot of grievances, which then those grievances um, then translated into, um, you know, uh, some of the political uh, instability in later, <coughs> in later life in Fiji. <coughs> now, uh, but I think, uh, again, uh, if you look deeply at his protectionist policies was not so much um, uh, we, 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 I mean, there are the a number of layers to it. One was that he uh, he was committed to the idea that uh, the the Tokay should not be overwhelmed by the Western culture, overwhelmed by the big entrepreneurs coming in to take the land, and therefore you have to have a protectionist policy in place just to make sure that they don't uh, fall into the same uh, path as what's happened in New Zealand, for instance. Now, now, the last part of my discussion has to do with some of the reflective lessons. What are some of the lessons we can learn from Ratskuna? Now, Ratskuna, he was a reformist, institutional reformist. He was a political reformist. He would have lied, he would have been happy to see reforms take place. The Great Council of Chiefs, for instance, is now being reviewed. He, because the Great Council of Chiefs has not, uh, there have been some changes over the years, but not significant enough. So there's probably a great opportunity uh, for that to happen with a team, a very well um, um, qualified team going around Fiji, collecting information, collecting data, and collecting the views of people and how. Um, the GCC can be reformed to be more relevant to the modern day. So he would have really be happy to see the process going on. He would also be uh, probably a bit disappointed to see that the Native Land Trust Board has not been reformed yet. When he put together the Native Land Trust Board in 1940, it was on the assumption that at some point, it was going to be temporary. At some point, he was going to go through another reform to meet up with the challenges of the time. 
And one of the biggest challenges for the Tokay landowners now has to do with how to use the land, how to generate income from the land, how to make sure that the resources in the land are fully utilized, something which the Native Land Trust Board uh, has never done. They only miss the leases. I remember meeting the general manager of the Native Land Trust Board some years back. Um, then I asked him, um, what did you put together? No, I actually mentioned to him. He was my former student. So I had uh, the guts to tell him what to do. Uh, why don't you set up a, a land innovation unit within the Native Land Trust Board to specifically look at how you can introduce land innovation and use and, and within the Fijian community. A lot of the land is unused. And um, a lot of the Toke farmers don't have the skills to be able to, uh, to transform their land. All they've been told by government after government over the years is use your land. But they won't be able to unless you provide, you facilitate the process uh, in terms of a structure of land use, for instance. Uh, I remember writing some time ago that one of the, what they can do is to have mobile agricultural innovation units going from village to village all over the place, uh, and then visiting, uh, uh, teaching them land innovation from different levels. Uh, and then, of course, you create the market later. So Rastakuna would have been thinking that way as a reformist. He was thinking of uh, marketization of land to the extent that you don't lose the land and being able to be part of the bigger global economy. But that not much has happened since we put, set, put together the Native Land Trust Board. And it's probably something which the, native, the new government can be looking at in terms of reforming the, the uh, uh, ILTB. <clears throat> The second issue has to do with inequality, equity, and inclusion uh, for Tokay into the economy. He would probably have been very, very disappointed uh, that we haven't really done much over the years about some of those. He, he worked very hard to try and address the issue of well-being of the Tokay people. But given the circumstances, he can only he could only do much. Now. Uh, the figures which uh, uh, has been banded around is that about something like 75% um, of the poverty in Fiji um, are Tokay, which is quite a, it's quite a significant um, you know, figure uh, indeed. I had an interview this morning with one of the uh, 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 newspapers in, in the city. Uh, one of the uh, things I said is that the problem of one ethnic group, such as poverty, becomes a problem of another. When you have, I went around town trying to have my shoe uh, polish. They, ha they don't have uh, shoe shine boys in New Zealand. So I have to come here uh, with my shoes. That's why it's a, uh, uh, and then we, having a shoe polish and these kids were walking up and down. And also read about the insecurity at night when you go into the city. The inequality has, has mushroomed, has gone worse and worse. Because a lot of the focus on development in the last few years has been on the corporate sector, on the urban areas. The rural areas have been um, uh, basically uh, left behind and the poor have been left behind, except for um, you know, giving them a few dollars which they use uh, for, to buy things and then that's it. Rather than any real structural reform to make sure that you address the issue of inequality. And uh, uh, an equity-based system is very, very important here, particularly after the reconciliation that we've had two, two weeks ago uh, with the church and the government, uh, which paved the way for the future of Fiji in terms of how ethnic groups can come together politically. Political reconciliation is easy, but economic to address the inequality takes a bit of challenge, takes a bit of uh, thinking as well. Some time ago, we had some affirmative action policies in place, but they've now uh, disappeared, thrown out of the, uh, uh, of the window by the last government. Affirmative action itself is not bad. Although the term affirmative action has been used in different countries to mean something ter terrible, also in the case of Fiji, use the word affirmative action, uh, then people will, uh, uh, will turn away because of the history of it. 
Now, in some countries like New Zealand, what I'm suggesting is that we get rid of the term affirmative action and just use the term equity. In New Zealand, they use the word equity-based so that you address inequality. The 75% okay were poor, uh, which make up the poverty. Uh, and, and eventually, it will address that particular issue. Now, in 2001, I, uh, again, I have to start admitting some of these uh, historical secrets. Uh, I put together the affirmative action plan. They asked me to do it, okay. But the, very, the framework was very equity-based. I worked out an equity index uh, for different ethnic groups, particularly the, uh, the Tokay and other ethnic groups. In education, it was almost, uh, almost equal. But in the corporate sector, it was one to eight. Um, yeah, it was just too much, really. Um, and then other sectors as well. So the idea was that uh, you have to address those inequities uh, with policies which make sense and which does not step on other people's toes, other ethnic groups in particular. One of the problems with the firm action in Fiji over the years uh, was that of state and political capture. So what they did with that affirmative action was that they took it and used it for political purposes uh, to buy votes rather than to address the plight of the ordinary poor Fiji uh, tokens. Now, um, so there has to be a shift in the way we frame it from um, entitlement. It was very much based on entitlement that I am okay, so therefore I need affirmative action. Rather, uh, so shift from that to equity, uh, because not all tokens will need it, uh, but the poor within the token community would need that. Probably the most significant and the most workable and the most beneficial affirmative action in Fiji has been in the area of education. I've, I've written a lot about affirmative action in South Africa, in Malaysia, what we did in Fiji was to, was to copy the Malaysian model. South Africa did the same thing. Mandela went to South Africa and said, oh, I want this. But then uh, the problem was the Malaysian model was not perfect. It led to a lot of corruption. And that was the model which was taken to one of the reasons why uh, Zuma, the president of uh, uh, South Africa, went to jail was because of this idea of entitlement, that the leaders that in these leaders, the idea is that in these leaders are entitled to affirmative action on behalf of the poor in their own country. And the same thing with the Malaysian prime minister who had $700 million in his pocket, was to do with in his bank account, was is now in jail, what was to do with a feeling of entitlement. He put together a company, presumably for the indigenous Malays, but then he used it to divert his account. So if we can clean up all the act in terms of redefining affirmative action to equity-based system, and then work out the equity uh, index so that you have well-targeted and keep it away from politics, keep it away from being used as a political tool as we've had in Fiji in the past. So when I was in Australia, I had left Australia and I heard from the Ministry of Finance that, oh, it's been taken by the Prime Minister uh, it's now relocated there, the affirmative, affirmative action um, uh, uh, strategy and program. I, uh, I said to myself, oh my gosh, this is the end of it. And of course, uh, the rest became, became history. Now, the third issue that Ratsukuna would have been interested in is to do with environmental protection. Climate change is a big issue now in the world. Uh, certainly in Fiji, certainly in the Pacific, in the whole world. Every country in the world has a target. Uh, to achieve, because he would have been able to connect climate change and environmental protection to the Vanua, uh, to the people that he was talking to, uh, because the most uh, research has found that the people who are the most vulnerable in a community in terms of climate change are the poor, are the people who are marginal, who are marginalized within their own communities. So he would have liked to see a decarbonized economy. He would have liked to see uh, protection of the environment because you protect the environment, you protect the people, you protect the land, the manure, and you protect everybody. But the other thing he would be thinking about now, looking at 
is being a bearer of wisdom, of knowledge, being uh, somebody who valued education at the highest level, uh, and how transformational education can be in society. Often in the last few years, especially when education had become, I've written on this, had become commodified, where you buy, and, it's like a commodity that you buy and sell in the market. Yeah. It's happening in New Zealand, in Australia, and to some extent it's coming to Fiji. Or universities, your job at university will determine will be determined largely by money. If you're able to generate money for the university through research funding or through your students, then you're safe. If not, ooh, ooh, X, go away, useless fellow. So that's how that's basically it in the modern day. So he wouldn't be very happy with it. He would have seen the value of education in terms of social transformation. Education is not for sale. Uh, education is for the purpose of transforming lives, transforming people, being able to give people a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose in life. Now, Ratchakuna was also a, uh, um, um, a peacemaker. He was able to reconcile uh, he was able to transcend the divide. Uh, in this early, like I mentioned earlier, he went to uh, Indo-Fijian school. It is very first um, inroad into education. And um, he developed that cross-cultural, he developed uh, that thinking about Fiji belonged to everybody. So he would have been happy to see the Grimby Day uh, taking place. He would have been happy to see reconciliation taking place. He would have been happy uh, to see the move towards uh, not only reforming the Great Council of Chiefs, in fact, uh, some of the narratives coming out uh, at the moment is how the Great Council of Chiefs can be used across and to include other ethnic groups as well uh, in terms of uh, uh, the way it operates uh, in terms of uh, the great council of chiefs becoming the supreme body for everybody uh, in other, uh, uh, all the other ethnic groups in Fiji. So he would have been uh, happy to see anything which would lead to peaceful Fiji. Now, now I've already talked about the Grimmick Day and how he would be happy to see that as a way in which the multiculturalism will work in the country. Now, last but not least, is all the time he was, he became a brand name, not only in Fiji. So he was the very first to create the Fiji brand. I remember four or five years ago, I was invited by the Fijian community in Auckland to go and uh, uh, give a speech during the Fiji Day celebration. And the focus of my speech was, was the Fiji brand. And one of the things which I said was, uh, for all those who, all of those who, all all Fijians are here, uh, everything that you do will reflect on that brand, the Fiji brand. The Fiji brand doesn't belong to the uh, uh, Fiji water, doesn't belong to the Fiji rugby union, or the Fiji First Party, or the Fiji uh, Alliance uh, Party, or other political parties who have Fiji, but it belongs to everybody. Uh, whoever you are. And I told the students, every time you fail your exam, you're giving that Fiji brand uh, a bad name. And every time you do something great, you're giving that Fiji brand uh, a very polished image. So wherever you are, whether you're a rugby player, whether you're a student or a farmer, uh, we all, without us realizing, in a subconscious way, we're engaged in either promoting the Fiji brand or we're destroying it. So he was probably the first, uh, because he's well known all around the Pacific, internationally as well, Oxford, in New Zealand uh, as well. Uh, so he was, if you like, the initiator of the Fiji brand. So it's up to us. And how do we make sure that the legacy of Rajkola in terms of the Fiji brand continues? Now, 
indeed, um, although I don't have much time, I could be here talking for as long as I want, uh, maybe the whole night, the whole week about Ratsakuna and some of the lessons that we can learn from him. But what um, a number of, a uh, couple of things to finally um, um, end the presentation today. One is how can we use some of the great deeds, some of this, the, the knowledge that he had, uh, the empathy that he had, and how he did things that can be lessons for today's Fiji. Often, Prachakuna, in the minds of historian, historians, in the minds of, um, of the only people of Fiji, is dead. Um, he was dead many years ago. But in fact, uh, in many cases, uh, after people are dead, then the legacy will live on. What are some of the great things we can generate out of that, that we can learn from for the future? And secondly, and last but not least, as Fiji begins to see itself as part of the big world that we are living in, as Fiji uh, goes through the process of, uh, after the reconciliation, trying to rebuild, as Fiji uh, celebrates Grimit Day and Ratsakuna Day, what is it, what is the kind of consciousness that we have generated together with this uh, memorialization of these events uh, that will guide us for the future. Because the future is very much determined by the present. It's also determined by the past. And so much of our consciousness about the future uh, should be based on how we build on the foundation of the past. And certainly in the case of uh, Ratsukuna, uh, a lot of things that is done has formed the foundation for post-independence Fiji and will continue to give us the inspiration for foundation for the future. With those words, I live in peace and uh, hope that you have some questions that we can share later. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Atua, for those insightful look into the life of uh, this great man, Ratuskuna, the impact of his life, and uh, what we can learn from that. So I'll open up the floor for any question. And I think we've got the uh, mic uh, that can be moved around. Okay, there's one question there from. Oh, the mic is there. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Tuba, for uh, that enlightening and uh, uh, insightful uh, presentation. Uh, my question uh, is on the point of uh, thermal conviction, in particular with regard to equity and the fact that you mentioned that it needs to be taken away from the politicians. So I was wondering as to what would be ideal in terms of that shift and to who you should shift that to and who each particular sector or community or individual, whoever, should be handling uh, the equity exercise. Well, thanks so much, Peter. Um, yeah, I think what, what I meant was uh, you see the way from politics and how it's politicized. Uh, the way from the election has uh, been politicized in some countries in the world, um, South Africa, for instance. In, uh, uh, in Malaysia, certainly, certainly in the case of Fiji, has been used for political purposes. It's been used to, to mobilize support uh, for the particular political party in power. Uh, and that is not what uh, we should be you know, having, uh, but rather we, can, we should have um, an equity-based, in fact, a lot of countries in the world but it's, uh, you know, uh, have equity-based uh, uh, policies. Uh, which are specifically targeted towards um, the, uh, uh, those who are vulnerable, uh, those who are marginalized, uh, as a way of making sure that they, their well being, are being looked after as well. So uh, uh, it's inevitable that any such policy 
will have to be within cabinet, uh, within uh, the political sphere, as it were. Uh, it's the way it's operationalized. Uh, it's the way in which the policy uh, is being used to, uh, uh, if you like, be integrated into the development agenda of a country. Uh, often, sometimes, um, in some of the Congress affirmative action, is a separate structure as a separate structure, as a separate uh, operational process, uh, when in fact, it really should be integrated into our development thinking. Thank you, Professor Yatuba, for your insightful lecture into the life of Dr. Sukuna. I have three criticisms, so please bear with me. Uh, the first is uh, I read uh, Dr. Sukuna's letters during a PhD research, the letters he used to write to the colonial authorities. And he treated the indigenous and forbade freedom fighters with a great amount of disdain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you look at the case of uh, Nabosa Bakundua, you look at the case of Lucy Nawai. He recommended the British to exile him. Yeah? It was not the British decision. He recommended it. So what's your view about it? And the second one is the Infotech got the right to vote very early in the ordinary period in 1963. Before that, the chiefs made the decision who should be presented in the field. Could Rajas Kuna have done anything so that the Infotech could have got the right to vote earlier? The third one is. Oh, um, sorry. Can you deal with your. How many questions do you have? This is the last one. 100? <laughs> yeah. The third one was he seemed to view the Indians as making profit from land. I think the words he used was the land means money, something like that, you know? So I, I think that contributed to a negative perception of Indian farmers as, uh, you know, making a lot of profit from the land. But that's just an observation. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Mosmi. Oh, I remember the names of people here. Uh, yeah, uh, the first question had to do with uh, um, uh, his position in relation to the early anti-colonial movements. Uh, no, that, that's true because anti-colonial movements were not only anti-British, but also anti-chiefs. Uh, because the chiefs were seen by them as what some writers refer to as the corporate class. They're collaborating with the British. So if you collaborate with the British, you also are enemies. Enemy. So a lot of the uh, 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 Ranawai and other uh, early uh, anti-colonial leaders um, had a view. So uh, he found himself, or it's going to find himself in a very, very, uh, uh, I suppose, challenging situation. He was okay. And those who, uh, the, the, the critics of the, of the uh, colonial government, including the chief system were okay. So it's uh, very much both uh, ethnic and class at the same time. So what would he do? So, uh, uh, so he probably saw them as disruptive, uh, although they had legitimate concerns as well, uh, in terms of uh, 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 the shift of power away from them into the colonial state uh, when Fiji became part of the British Empire in 1874. So, uh, uh, and they were in the Louvenway movement, and you have from Hawaii uh, and so forth, who was exiled. Uh, so, yes, you're right. Arachukuna, uh, given his position then, not only as a chief, but also as part of the British colonial state, he became lapped together with, with them, as it were, uh, in relation to how the, uh, uh, the opposition. Uh, groups to the colonial power were perceived. So Rajkuna was perceived by them as such as well. So uh, uh, the second question had to do with, well, so many questions, I'll move on to the second one. What was the second one again? Oh, yes, of course, of course, 1963, the, the right to vote uh, took place. That was well after Rajkuna had died. Uh, Rajkuna was, uh, uh, I mentioned earlier about uh, the social Darwinian thinking 
that he was influenced by. He was a British head in those days. And part of the thinking was that for the colonized people, particularly those of uh, uh, non-white uh, complexion, because they're still evolving, uh, they don't, uh, uh, what you've got to do is you put together institutions uh, to make sure that they get protected at the same time they evolve. Uh, and uh, so the idea then, uh, not only him, but also the British colonial state itself, uh, the election, uh, because the British were very protective of the power. Anyway, one of the ways in which they did that was to take away the political right, the electoral right of, this, uh, of those who they colonized as a way of maintaining their control. So election was seen as a, a bad thing uh, because it would mean that people can use the voting power to get rid of the colonial state uh, authorities. So uh, uh, I suppose in Rotskona's mind, he was thinking, okay, uh, this can continue for some time until later. Um, he probably would have uh, endorsed the uh, eventual uh, right to vote uh, at another stage because of the evolution of nature of his thinking uh, and the way in which the world has changed and how that will happen. So the last uh, question was to do with, uh, can you help me again, Mosley? Yeah, you use the words like to describe the Indian being farmers as making profit from the land. Oh, yeah, oh, all right, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, um, yeah. The different ways in which one can interpret that. Yeah. Um, I mean, certainly the uh, one of the differences between the Indo-Fijians, the early days, as well as the Tokay, uh, as a result of a native policy, the native the, uh, the Tokays were locked into the subsistence sector in the villages. They only came out of that in the 1960s, uh, while the Indo-Fijians were very much part of the uh, commercial economy as sugarcane farmers and business people as well. So uh, it's easy to uh, uh, to see what people are doing, uh, like we've been involved in business. You certainly would be involved in making profit as well. Uh, so whether what he was saying can be seen as something negative or simply describing the situation uh, is a matter of interpretation. Okay, any other question? But only one, please. Don't give me four or five questions, only one. Yes, please. Uh, so just uh, basing upon that uh, previous question, uh, uh, would you uh, think that uh, whatever issues that Kratzkuna was pointing at um, as a cause of the uh, delay in the advancement of the Itauke, uh, would you think that uh, it was based on the uh, previous uh, in interpretation of the colonials of the indigenous uh, social cultural systems. What are your views on that? Yeah, sorry, I couldn't get a question. Uh, uh, so, so what are you asking? Is so, Kuno was, was pointing out some of the issues yeah. uh, that was a cause of uh, the uh, delay in the advancement of the economic, right. yeah. the economic sector. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you think uh, that had uh, Anything to do with the the way the colonials um, uh, represented the uh, Itoke social structures and institutions, which they came up with, which is still standing uh, standing today. Uh, yeah. So the uh, um, so the Itoke institutions, which were set up, great kinds of chiefs, the Fijian Affairs Board, and all the. Uh, if you look at it in context, wherever the British were they were also involved in setting up some of these institutions. Uh, and the whole idea from the French, sorry, from French, from the British point of view, uh, uh, this is where it's important to kind of shine some historical light into how people are thinking. Uh, a lot of the, a uh, lot of us, a lot of the Tokay uh, saw these institutions as something which will protect us and uh, facilitate our advancement. The British saw things differently. Uh, they saw these institutions with the setup, they call them native institutions in other parts of the world here as well. As, as means of control, 
how they can best control. Because if you're a colonial power, uh, you're not so much there to look to facilitate the, the well-being of the people under you. Under you. Uh, it's how best you can control them because the forces which were driving colonialism were to do with, uh, uh, with the market. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons why they use laborers from around the world, including laborers from India, so that they can feed into the British colonial economy, which was huge, the biggest in the world. Based on it was based on slavery in the early days, and then in gender system, uh, and then uh, other kinds of institutions, land to do with land and to do with resources, uh, were deliberately geared towards sustaining the profit system. Mm. And how do you control people? Control the resources to make sure, and that's what indirect rule is all about. You make use of the indigenous institution as a way of just keep them, uh, you know, happy for the time being. While we take this and that, they didn't everywhere. Um, so, uh, uh, so Ratskura would have been aware of that. He would have, uh, because he, said, he was smart, he was educated in Oxford and saw the dynamics of the colonial mind. So, how do you respond to that? So, instead of starting a revolution against the British, uh, he thought maybe we move slowly and work with them uh, towards uh, independence. But the thing about the British was that eventually, after the Second World War, uh, they were ready to give up their colonies. Unlike the French, the French, once you become part of the French Empire, when you're French for life, they tell you, you'll get rid of your identity, you'll get rid of your uh, religion or whatever, whatever, uh, you become French. You drink out fine wine and all those things and you become French. That's why they didn't allow for independence until they fight, uh, they, they fought for, for, for independence. In Algeria, they kicked them out. In Vietnam, they kicked the French out uh, all over the place. In New Caledonia, in French Polynesia, they're still there. Um, so despite the attempt to kick them out, they're still there. The British were much easier. So the British were more evolutionary. So Ratsukunda would have uh, thought about how to use the British evolutionary process as well to move towards a desired uh, political outcome. Yeah. If Fiji was a French colony, he would have started a revolution. Yeah. Yeah. Mobilize the villages, resume. Yeah. Perhaps we'll take uh, one or two more questions before before your questions. Uh, good evening, Professor Ratuba. Over here. Yeah. Um, um, I'm oh. Christian Oluwai, and I'm asking you this question in my capacity as a final year politics student here at the university. And I must say I'm a big fan of the political element of the work that you do. And my question to you today is, um, if Ratu Sukuna was living today, and given the political climate that we inherited from the era that he lived in, because he represents more than just visionary leadership, he also represents elitism and uh, colonialism. So my question, two factors, sorry, that led to political instability uh, in this country, giving birth to ideas of racism and racial tension, a factor that dominates our political ecosystem still today, uh, leading up to any election. So my question to you today is, if he was living today and given the um, ideals that he represents and his legacy represents, do you think that um, he would agree to the idea of celebrating Dr. Sukhum again, given the baggage of his legacy? And would he sacrifice that um, in exchange of political stability um, here, given the factors that I've stated. Oh, so uh, it was a long question. Uh, so, so a question has to do with if he was alive now, would he have agreed to what's going to Given the ideals that he okay. represents in modern years. So uh, if he was alive now, would he have agreed to what's going to be? In terms of the principles, in terms of uh, 
trying to learn from some of the great deeds that he, that he had done um, uh, would have been um, would have been um, something he would have probably endorsed. <coughs> and usually, people become iconic. Their mana becomes um, uh, deepened and broadened uh, after they die. I'm not saying that you uh, you know go and do something about that. Uh, and then to become famous, no, uh, because of well, the reason that because you're no longer there, what lives on is the memory of what you've done, and usually people take other people's memory as a way of reminding themselves about the significance of perpetuating some of those values and some of those ideas which the people uh, have had. So I mean, uh, there have been a lot of people still alive, uh, we're well, not very useful, but we commemorate their days. Um, like, remember Prince Charles birthday, yeah. um, you know, uh, in New Zealand, uh, people laugh when I said, oh, you mean you had Prince Charles birthday? I don't know whether they still have it. Uh, but in terms of legacy, what has Prince Charles done? But now he's a king, so maybe after he dies, then maybe, some of the legacies of what uh, you know he did uh, would become part of our history. But anyway, we are no longer part. Uh, well, yeah, and the head of state is no our head of state is no longer the queen, the monarch. Anyway, yes, I think he would have probably uh, said yes, but based on the values, some of the things which I mentioned about him, uh, because he was such a humble person. You probably said, um, not sure. Well, it's up to you what you do with it. Uh, I doubt very much if he would have said, given his personality, yes, do it for me. Yeah. When I die, please, my will is have a national holiday at some point. He didn't do it because of the nature of his uh, personality. Maybe one last question. We've got the lady there who provides some questions. Please, sir. Good evening, and thank you, uh, Professor Rutuba. My question is, what would you suggest for the GCC that's now convening in Bao Island regarding our taking part in politics? Sorry, I'm just You're a moment. putting me on the spot, man. <laughs> I'm very interested in this because I know that the GCC is an institution that they Toki really look up to. And they're coming back. Uh, it's a very big thing for everyone. And the recognition that they still gain from everybody is so weak. But given the transitions of Fiji's political paradigm shifts and the involvement of chiefs. Mm -hmm. How would you, or what would you suggest the roles that they should play in moving Fiji forward? Well, thanks so much for the very, uh, very big question. Uh, now you put me on, on the spot. Uh, hope I'll be, after this, I'll be allowed to come back. Yeah. <laughs> a number of things. One is uh, because they're going through a reform at the moment, the review of the GCC, uh, which is a great idea. Uh, it's a very good team. Uh, I know all of them. They're all very well versed with Fiji's history, politics, as well as uh, organizational and institutional reform. A number of things. One is how can we make the GCC become more relevant? Because a lot of not only indigenous Fijians, but also other ethnic groups, in terms of uh, uh, the lot of issues which we're facing, the okay, we're facing the crime, unemployment. Development. I was talking about the inequity, inequality. Seventy-five percent poverty. That's very high. Uh, these are issues which need to be addressed. How can this seed be reconfigured to become much more proactive uh, in these matters? Because they are supposed to represent the leadership of the Tokyo community. Now, that's one. Secondly, is uh, how transformational can they be? Now, we don't. I mean, uh, studies around the world have shown that if an institution does not transform itself to adapt to a changing environment, then it's bound to be left behind 
uh, and sometimes it might collapse. So one of the reasons why, uh, how adaptable is the GCC in terms of responding to emerging economic, political, and cultural issues, not only in Fiji, in the villages, a lot of those issues are happening. And in towns, and of course, in the region, and internationally as well, the Fijians everywhere, the Tokyo is everywhere, in, um, in the United States, in Australia, New Zealand, and they sustain, in many ways, they sustain the economy here for remittance. Remember, we used to laugh at Samoans and Tongans many years ago for relying too much on remittance, but now they're turning around and laughing at us uh, because uh, it's the second largest <clears throat> income earner for the country, the remittance. So all these people around the world, when you draw the map of Fiji now, it's Vano Lebu, Viti Lebu, Kandabu down here, Lau, Nasawa, uh, you know, within the Enrotuma up there. But if you draw the global map of Fijians, it's the world map. So how can that world map, Fijians everywhere around the world, how can the GCC connect? I was talking about the term uh, constellation. Constellation has to do with connections between stars, connections between entities, uh, connect all these people together uh, to the GCC. That's, that's, a, that's one, one of the challenges. The other challenge is to do with how resilient it can be. Resilience in terms of being able to be durable and draw the line between what it's supposed to be doing and the political dynamics around it. The GCC has been used politically in the past by the military, by political parties, by politicians. And as a result of that, its image has been punished a little bit. So it has to maintain a sense of mana and independence in a way which is not politicized and thus overshadow its credibility. The other issue uh, is to do with uh, uh, inclusion and how the GCC can be an agent of inclusion, including people of different cultures. And even within the Tokay community, a lot of Tokay uh, uh, people, particularly some of the provinces and some of the communities which are marginal, the GCC has always been seen is something for the big for the big chiefs. So it's both inclusion within the Tokyo community and inclusion across the, uh, the ethnic divide. But inclusion is defined in different ways by different people. The inclusion uh, doesn't mean that everybody can be sitting together in the Great Council of Chiefs meeting. Yeah. But inclusion at different levels in the way it operates, uh, a structure of it is something which uh, the review team will probably be looking at. I suppose the other last issue, I can go on, I can, maybe I have a hundred uh, things which I want to say, but maybe the last one, uh, because the, the chair is beginning to feel uneasy and impatient. And the last one is to do with imagery. Imagery is, everything political now is to do with image. Image making, you vote on the basis of imagery. Uh, the image of somebody you like. Uh, you buy things on the basis of image. You buy Coca-Cola, not because you like it. It's just water, sugar, and terrible chemicals which will kill you. But what you're buying is the image. Yeah. The image which is being advertised over and over again. When you're thirsty, yes, Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola. Uh, but sometimes an imagery can be destructive as well. You've seen that in our young people. The level of diabetes held in this country with certain is worse than all the time, partly because of the image of selling. Growing up, I saw the, the Twisties games, the Coca-Cola games, the noodles games, in, ingrained into the consciousness about the need to eat these things and drink these things. And what we have now, those who are having the legs being, uh, you know, amputated and the high level of, uh, uh, <clears throat> of diabetes is what I call, I told somebody, or it was an interview some time ago, the noodle and Coca-Cola generation. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's killing us. They should ban them from running school sports. Yeah, they've done that in some countries. But anyway, I'm diverting a bit because it has to be said. So the GCC will have to project an image which is positive, an image which is inclusive, an image because the image in the past has been disastrous in many ways. 
he has been seen as an, as an nationalistic institution. One of the reasons why the last government uh, got rid of them because of a particular image which they had in their mind. So they have to re-image themselves in the new review uh, so that the image can also be part of what I mentioned earlier, the Fiji brand. Uh, is there a particular brand which they can project, which can unify, which can address issues of conflict, which can address issues of uh, uh, well-being, which I was talking about earlier. So there's a whole lot of things which we can think about to make sure that the GCC becomes relevant uh, in terms of uh, uh, sustainability, uh, in terms of the way it will continue to, 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 uh, to survive and, uh, and how, uh, given the reform, the review that's going on now, uh, I'm sure they're thinking about some of these things. And I'm sure that they're going to uh, recommend a number of uh, suggestions, which will be basis for the discussion as well. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Uh, ladies and uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure uh, you've enjoyed uh, Professor Ratuva's presentation as much as I do. Um, all good things must come to an end. And uh, to Professor Ratuva, your lecture has always been, as usual, like a storytelling. It's like storytelling, a, a story that is intriguing, interesting. And I was not impatient that, that it should come to an end. In fact, I would like to keep to hear you to continue with the story. Can I continue? <laughs> so please let's put our hands together again for Dr. Ratuva. I, I take this opportunity to thank the uh, Ministry of, of Vitokia Affairs, in particular the Minister of Vitokia Affairs, who sponsored um, this uh, event. And also would like to take the opportunity to thank the Ratus Day National Committee, and the members who organized uh, this event as well. And uh, I would like to take this, this opportunity also to thank uh, the USP staff who, who put together these wonderful uh, decorations with the help of the Ministry of Development Affairs. Thank you. And finally, I would like to thank you for your presence today for your contributions that has made this event very successful. Thank you so much. And I think this opportunity to please invite you for some refreshments outside there, and also you have the chance to meet uh, Professor Latuva for any questions. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's why the thing you just said was okay. What of the thing? Then the 
ఎడిటింగ్ ఇస్తాను Now, as you are leaving, uh, please, uh, if you are free tomorrow, uh, join us at TV Fiji National University campus uh, in uh, Nasinu. Uh, Professor Atubo will be there, and also at the University of uh, Fiji campus in Samambula. Uh, so, uh, 